boom, orange pill, part two. You better take the orange pill or else the orange pill is going to take you. I apologize, guys. It's it's windy tonight. Uh, I don't have my microphone and I, I live in Miami Beach. So there's people that are like flooring their cars and blaring music as loud as they possibly can because that's just simply normal here. All right. So some of the some of the video, this, the quality of the audio might not be that great, but just bear with me and try to listen to what I say because it's important. OK. The bigger picture. What is the bigger picture here? And I wanted to point this out because a lot of people forget about this or lose sight of this. OK. Obviously, most people that get into cryptocurrency uh, do so because either, you know, want to make money or they want to do some degen type shit, right? The fun stuff, which is totally okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But what is the bigger picture of which this technology was actually designed for? What was the original intention of Satoshi Nakamoto and the cyberpunks that went and released this technology out into the ecosystem. That's what people are forgetting about. And I think it's important for us to remember that because that's why, that's why the, the original Bitcoin, that's why what it was created. That's kind of like the main reason why most of these cryptocurrencies and these tokens and digital assets were created. Okay. And to make it short and sweet, the bigger picture was really to allow humans, us, to have control over our own finances. So to reiterate, the decentralization of your own finances. Okay? It's that simple. Alright? Another thing, since we're talking about Bitcoin here, uh, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist, alright? But you can replace this with whatever your favorite digital digital payment network system is, all right? I'm just using Bitcoin because that's what I wanted to talk about. But if you want to say Dogecoin because you believe that Dogecoin is a better uh, payment processing system, then go ahead. But uh, what, what is a Bitcoin maximalist? Is that someone that believes that Bitcoin is the uh, ultimate store of value out of all of the digital currencies? Because that's not like a uh, hypothetical, that's like an actual fact. Um, I won't sit and waste a bunch of time talking about why, why that is, but do your own research if you don't believe me. Is a Bitcoin maximalist someone that thinks that Bitcoin, the number one, is the driver and the main controller of the rest of the prices in the, the cryptocurrency market? All right. Then sure, then you can call me a Bitcoin max, so a maximalist if you want. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But again, I, like, I definitely don't think that uh, everything that isn't a Bitcoin is a shit coin. All right, there's definitely like plenty of use cases for a lot of these other digital assets. Okay, so don't don't get that, don't be getting that twisted. A lot of the things we talked about in the previous video lean into this, but essentially, we as humans right now with this current financial system that, that we have, don't really have governance and control over our own finances, right? And that's because we're using currency that needs an intermediary, so banks and the central banking system, in order to withdraw, transfer, move, do anything with our money that we want to, right? You guys know that I don't like banks. Uh, like a lot of people don't like banks. And if you think about it, you don't really use a bank. Uh, a bank uses you because you don't get anything out of them other than the fact that if you want a debit card to go swipe and use or a credit card, you have to have money inside of a bank. So if you have a job, you need to have a bank to have your direct deposit go into, all right? And and that's kind of the whole reason why we have a bank. We have to go through this this third party, uh, which is really not just one per, one party. It's it's a, it's a third party system. So it's a, it's multiple parties and actors together, in order to do anything with our funds. Right, literally anything. If you ever want to go withdraw even like a large amount of cash out of your bank account, 
you have to sign papers, you have to do all this BS. It, it's a pain. There's people that are probably watching this video that have tried to withdraw, you know, probably more than like $10,000 of cash at a time out of their bank and have had some sort of issue with it, right? And so Bitcoin itself, and again, we're talking about Bitcoin here, but you can just replace that with whatever you want. Its purpose was to not have to even worry about that, right? You, you have uh, control over your own finances and you can do with it as you please. You don't need to ask permission. You don't have to pay fees or whatever. I mean, you have to pay part of the network fee, but it's incredibly cheap compared to like any kind of fee that your bank's ever gonna, ever gonna charge you or ever has charged you, right? And this is the bigger picture, right? It's not all the bigger picture, but this is one of the, this is what I think is the, you know, to, to make it short and sweet, the actual, one of the actual most important things that people tend to forget about. So going back to the first video uh, where I talked about a bunch of issues with the current financial system, all right? One thing that I didn't get into deep on, which I don't think I'm probably gonna be able to, to finish all that in this video either, but the financial system is basically backed by debt, all right? Uh, and this this whole entire thing, it's like, I've, I've like, I've, I started learning about this a long time ago when I was in college, being a crazy conspiracy theorist kid, but it's not like, it's not like this is hidden information or anything. It's just that the way that people explain it is it's never a hundred percent easy to understand. And it's like, it never always tends to come from the same, um, the same source and the same, I never have been able to get a complete understanding on it. And I don't really don't think anyone truly understands like how they just literally print money. But in essence, what the federal reserve does is they buy things on their balance sheet. All right. So they buy like things that are of actual value. So, uh, real estate, uh, bonds, which is coming from the federal government. Right. And we can try to talk about that later on, but basically they, they put things on their balance sheet. Okay. And then they go ahead and it, print money and they don't literally like print money although like they do create money but they just basically like like magic as if it was magic they just send other banks um money uh digitally right so they really are just like numbers on the screen is it's all that that's really happening there okay and they're able to do that because of the way that the system is currently allowed to be and I say allowed because it, that's that's what it is people just allow it to be that way right now and since this is the case basically the current financial system incentivizes us and everyone including banks to get into debt okay this is a basically a debt-based financial system all right I'll try to ex expand upon that in the next video okay and I'll come to some citing some, some statistics and some facts and sources next time because I think that's going to be important. I don't want to just like say this stuff and you guys just automatically believe me. All right. But we'll get into that. And then finally, another part, again, to reiterate, I know it sounds like a broken record, but fiat monetary systems do not last. Okay. They just simply don't last. All right. This is a big problem. All right. Now on to the actual orange pill part. Bitcoin, digital assets, cryptocurrencies in general are all designed to be a better store of value than fiat currency, so the US dollar, and gold too, believe it or not, okay? Um, if you were one of those people, if you are a boomer and you had been saving cash in a bank account somewhere, thinking that by the time you retire, if you have $1 million cash that that cash will be able to last you, you know, until your death, probably not going to happen. Okay. Uh, essentially every year that money has been stored in a bank account, you can basically deduct 15% of it. Okay. Um, this is a big reason why Michael Saylor from micro strategies decided to pretty much put micro strategies entire balance sheet into Bitcoin. And again, another thing that I'll probably have to talk about later, but just something I wanted to note, like the U the U S dollar is not a good store of value. It's you're actually like, you're actually, you know, in order to put money into your bank account as a, U as a form of U S dollar, 
hoping that it's going to get you somewhere in the future is the equivalent of uh, the same analogy that I made in the first video. You, you're trying to like take water out of a floating ship and the hole just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It's just not going to cut it. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's a sad tragedy, but, and then this is something that people don't realize. And a lot of people are doing the wrong thing because they're, they're not told otherwise, or if they are told otherwise, it's by nefarious actors or people who just quite frankly, don't, don't know what they're talking about. So on again to Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, insert whatever your favorite one is there, being a better store of value. The reason of this is because, uh, and we'll talk about Bitcoin, it is thermo, literally thermodynamically superior to cash, okay? And I say the word thermodynamically because what is money? Money is literally energy. It's like, you can think of it like life force, okay? How do you receive money? You, you have to put energy and effort into something in order to get money as, as your return, right? And even if you have something that's passive income, right, you, you had to do something to set yourself up in that place. You had to give and exert energy to get a return on that, okay? So if you think about it, if money is energy or life force, because it, it is, and especially for people who are working like jobs that are like hourly, right? Someone that does something and gets an hourly rate, you are giving up your time in exchange for a store of your value of basically like yourself, right? So why, why would you put your own life energy into something that's going to literally dwindle and diminish by a certain percentage every single year when you could put it in something that at the very least does not do that, okay? This is why Bitcoin, this is why Bitcoin is superior. This is why you need to take the orange pill. If you are someone and you've spent, you know, you're in, you're in your 60s, you spent your entire life working and you want to pass on your wealth to your family or you want to give it to your dog or you want to give it to a charity, by the time you die, if you've had that stored in US dollar, you would have literally lost years of your life energy from it just just by the nature of the US dollar losing value, okay? And it's it's really sad to think about that, that people are like literally, since they don't know, they are literally losing time from their life that they have put into a store of value in hopes to keep it for the future, okay? This is why you need to take the orange pill. So if you don't take the orange pill, you're literally throwing your life, your life force into the void. Okay. Another reason why crypto is superior is because it can't be stolen from you. All right. Now, I guess theoretically someone could come and steal your ledger if you have your Bitcoin on like a hard drive or a hard wallet somewhere, but are they going to be able to get access to that uh, by just plugging in the computer? No, they need your, your, your seed phrase or whatever sort of passwords. Um, X, Y, and Z to get it from you, okay? So if people want to receive money or take money from somebody, they can't just like garnish it from your ledger, right? They have to properly incentivize you to give them what they want, okay? Pretty important, right? And this is due to the decentralized nature of these networks, right? You can't just garnish someone's Bitcoin from their wallet because it's not like it's being stored at your local Chase Bank branch, right? That you can't just you can't just go and do that. You'd have to have consensus in order to, to, to do something like that on the entire network, which would be pretty much impossible for um, one person or one entity to do. And if they were to try to do it, uh, it would take probably at least a year for them to set up all the mechanics in place to even get their foot into the consensus. And then by the time that even happens, it's like you would already be exposed and known about. And, and that's just assuming that just you creating a node or several nodes would just automatically give you majority consensus, which it's not going to, right? Another reason why Bitcoin is superior is because it has a finite supply, right? You can't just go ahead and 
print more Bitcoin. Theoretically, there could be a time that comes where the 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 network would come to a consensus that hey, we might need to make more Bitcoin. Uh, that's that's literally going to be over a hundred years from now when that would be the case, and I don't don't think that will happen because everyone on the network would have not everyone but the majority of the network consensus would have to agree with that and by the time that even happens there will be so many more nodes in the network that uh, it's a lot of people to agree together with on one thing so if they were to agree upon it it would probably be for a good reason right but that just doesn't make sense to me because um, Bitcoin is pretty much almost infinitely divisible uh, with the amount of Satoshis per, per whole coin right um, and that's something we can also get into, but hope that makes sense. It, if, if it doesn't, if you have one whole Bitcoin, uh, there's X amount of Satoshis per Bitcoin. Um, a, a way to think about it is like, if you have one whole dollar, there's how many pennies are in a dollar, right? It's the same concept. Change is coming, okay? While all the big institutions and the governments were saying, orange coin bad, don't buy the orange coin, it's bad. Uh, <clears throat> come to find out years later, they were all buying the entire time, right? Uh, this year we found out that almost every single major bank and major player uh, that was originally years ago, back in 2017, saying, this Bitcoin's bad, it's going to zero, all of a sudden has come out and said, oh, by the way, uh, yeah, we actually have had some, but you guys didn't know that? Oh, oh you, so you guys weren't buying? Right, um, we have already have lots of companies who have publicly came out and said it, but I'm willing to suspect there's a lot more out there that have not said it yet, right? Because it probably just simply they're they're not publicly traded companies and they just don't have to disclose what is in their balance sheet. But don't be surprised if there's some governmental organizations that have that have some Bitcoin. Okay, uh, don't don't be fooled in thinking that's not the case. And if you were listening to what they said when they said orange coin bad, uh, I don't know why you listened to them because it's, yeah, I don't know what to tell you about that. But the governments that weren't buying Bitcoin, if, if and when the time comes that we no longer have uh, fiat monetary systems being our um, world reserve currency, then you could think of Bitcoin in that case as a Trojan horse because they will be forced to buy it eventually if and when that day comes, all right? So Bitcoin, if you if you would consider it to be a Trojan horse, then you can think of it as a trick and a treat, all right? It's, it's a treat because the people that believed in it and got into it early, they were rewarded for that. They, they had a nice little treat and it's a trick and because it's, it spreads itself so far and so deep into everything that the people who didn't believe in it will will be eventually forced to, to believe in it at at uh, just just in order to stay to stay alive and, and sustain uh, what what they currently have. Now they might not be rewarded for it other than they, they can sustain what they currently have. But uh, yeah, that's what happens when you don't take logical approaches to situations that involve the financial well-being of your country or your institution or whatever. One more thing I want to talk about before we end this, and I'm definitely going to have to do another video because it's just way too much for one or two videos. Um, and I need to go back and expand upon things that I've already talked about and said that I would. But the current uh, the current FUD over the whole Bitcoin, orange coin, energy, bad is... If people are, are saying that, then they haven't spent enough time studying uh, studying Bitcoin specifically, okay? Because if you did, you would know that that's most certainly not the case, all right? All right, I hope that made sense. Uh, I hope a lot of that wasn't a little bit too much rambling. I know I usually tend to get off subject because I'm ADHD and yeah, but if you liked what you heard, uh, drop a like, smash like, drop a comment, share the news, guys. Sh share this video to your grandma. Make your grandma buy Bitcoin. Tell your grandma to go on Coinbase to unload her 401k and then go to Coinbase and uh, press the max button and buy 
I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But seriously, share this information with your family because or your friends because this is this is not a joke. Um, you are going to need to take the orange pill, or else the orange pill is going to take you. Later. <laughs>